Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Sometimes when we get into disagreements with anyone, our temptation is to malign them in our thoughts or our words because of who they are or what they're about or some other reason that justifies, we think, our willingness to build walls between us and them. But today as we study 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll see that our highest priority has to be the cross and submitting to the power of the cross to bring us together in Christ. So welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado, and this is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible. Today, we're starting our study of the book of 1 Corinthians, and today's episode, we're looking at chapter 1. Now, as we're turning to 1 Corinthians, we are turning to a book that most of us have probably heard of, maybe even read a few times, and if that's you, then you know that 1 Corinthians is not easy reading, nor is it for the faint of heart. Throughout this book, Paul does more than just draw a line in the sand. He establishes principles of right thinking and right behavior and right living. And and he basically says anything else is, well, not right. And so as we study this book, we may find a spiritual battle going on within us. The truths that we're going to be digging into are the kinds of truths our flesh wants to rebel against. And so when we come to those times where we're like, I just don't like what I'm hearing about or reading about, well, rather than rejecting what Paul says, We need to bring our struggles to the Lord in prayer and submit them to him that the Holy Spirit might crucify our flesh. We discussed that principle back in Romans 8, 13. And now we're just going to bring all this before the Lord and let him transform us and renew us according to his truth. And so as we go on to 1 Corinthians or even 2 Corinthians, we need to recognize that there will be times that these truths will be a struggle for us. And yet, if we submit ourselves to the Lord and let his spirit renew our mind according to his truth, we will emerge on the other side a more devoted and obedient and spirit-filled believer. And so with that, let's start with some background information to this important book here. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth around 55 AD. It's one of the earlier letters of the New Testament, and Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus somewhere during the events that are recorded in Acts 19 to 20. Now, Paul knew the church of Corinth well because he'd already spent 18 months in Corinth back in Acts chapter 18. He was the founder of the church, and he had just this, this pastoral love for the people. And yet it was a challenging ministry. There was so much worldliness going on there. It was still a part of the individual's lives, still affecting the church life and the varying degrees of transformation as people were giving up the various aspects of worldly thinking. It was just causing disunity among them. Now, the city of Corinth had much to draw them away from Christ. Corinth itself was a large seaport located on the, this little narrow strip, about four mile wide narrow strip of land, almost like a land bridge between two sections of Southern Greece. Because it was so narrow, sometimes boats would want to get from one side of the water to the other side. And rather than going around the entire peninsula that was there, uh, they would just take the ships out of water and roll them across the four miles of land and then go to the other side. Just that narrow. And so Corinth was a hub of, of commerce and trade. It was a prosperous city that appealed to the interests of a wide variety of people. Uh, Corinth had a serious athletic game department. Um, they had two theaters, or, or at least two theaters. One super large one could hold 20,000 people. Another could hold 3,000 people. They had all kinds of temples, all kinds of palaces, all kinds of places of worship. And yet, with all of that, Corinth was also known for its debauchery. They had a deeply immoral trade around the goddess Aphrodite. Uh, the southern side was lined with taverns, and they were known for their underground cisterns that they would put their drinks in to cool them on off. Corinth was so immoral that in other places in that area, the name Corinth was something of kind of like an insult. Like if someone said to you, hey, you're acting like a Corinthian, they're saying you're being immoral. If they refer to a woman as like a Corinthian girl, they were saying she was a prostitute. It was to this sinful city that Paul brought the gospel in 51 AD, and he spent an entire year and a half there preaching the gospel and building up the saints. But you can see why this ministry was not easy. The transforming work of the gospel was hard and and people were struggling to forsake their old ways. And and so by the time Paul wrote this letter, even though the church had been established for several years, they were still struggling with sin. Something else that we need to keep in mind as we're going through this letter is that 1 Corinthians is not actually the first letter that Paul wrote to this church. This is his second letter. In chapter 5, he refers to an earlier letter, which has since been lost. And, And so the letter that we call 1 Corinthians was actually the second letter he wrote to them. We don't know when he wrote that letter or why he wrote that first letter, but he wrote this letter we know from Ephesus while he was staying there for two years on his third missionary journey. Now, Paul wrote this letter for a couple reasons. 
One reason is listed right here in chapter 1, verse 11. Paul says he's heard of the disunity of the Corinthian church from Chloe's people. Paul is also writing this letter because they have actually reached out to him with various questions. To their credit, they knew they were having problems, and so they reached out to Paul for help. And so this is his reply. And seven times he's going to be saying things like, well, now concerning, or now, and that's just Paul's way of answering specific questions that they had sent to him. Now, all of this is to say that the book of 1 Corinthians is pretty much dealing with problems. And often we're going to find that the problems that they were dealing with are the kinds of things and challenges we're dealing with today. And the challenge they had with his answers might be the kind of challenges we have too. And so again, as we read through this book, this is definitely one of those passages of scripture. We should do this every time, but definitely now where we begin and end in prayer seeking God's grace to be renewed in our thinking so that we would just submit to what he has communicated in his word through the Apostle Paul. And so with that as a background, let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 1 opens with Paul's normal customary greetings to his letters. He mentions a guy named Sosthenes, who was the leader of the synagogue in Corinth. And in Acts 18, 17, this guy was so devoted to the Lord, he was beaten for becoming a follower of Christ. Going into verse 2 here, Paul addresses this letter to the saints who were in Corinth who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now that term saint here, it's important just to pause right here because that term saint here is referring to a true believer who has been made holy in Jesus. The word saint, just this idea of being holy. In fact, in the Bible, every true believer is a saint. Uh, Saints are not special people we pray to. In fact, we should never pray to anyone but the Lord. And so, because every believer is made righteous in Christ, every believer is a saint, and therefore every believer is holy in Christ. Now, this is a key point that we need to keep in mind throughout this letter, because we're about to dive into many unpleasant aspects of church life. These people were struggling with how to bring their entire life into submission to Christ, and we might be tempted to be like, oh man, what's going on there? But we got to realize that they were righteous in Christ. These are still saints here. Remember, we saw throughout the book of Romans that righteousness before God is based on accepting the righteousness that he offers to us through the cross of Christ. The Christian life then is just learning to walk by the righteousness that is now ours in Christ. And so even though this church was struggling in their walk, they were still born again. Uh, Their sin is not okay, but the presence or the absence of it did not make or negate the fact that they were truly saints and were already sanctified in Christ Jesus. And so to this struggling church, Paul could still gladly say in verses 3 and 4, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. They are recipients of God's grace. They are true brothers and sisters in the Lord. Paul did not doubt it, even though they didn't always live like it. In fact, in the next set of verses, he is reassuring them of this very fact. And so in verses 5 to 8, Paul wants them to know that when he was doing ministry with them in that year and a half back in Acts 18, they had already had such a rich spiritual foundation. And through that time, the Lord had confirmed his calling of them. And and as they now eagerly wait for his return, when he does return, the Lord himself will confirm that indeed they are his because of the transforming work of the gospel in their life. Yeah, they're struggling now, but their struggles are evidence that God is transforming them. And so in verse 9, Paul is calling them to trust in the faithfulness of God and his calling on their life. Paul's going to refer to this principle of God's calling in their lives and his choice of them to be his people. He's going to refer to that just in this chapter alone here in verse 9, 25, 26, 27, 28, and verse 30. In fact, much of what he's going to be saying is based upon that very principle. God chose you and has called you and, and live in light of that calling. And so now as we go to the rest of this chapter here, with these niceties now established, Paul then exhorts them to not allow divisions among them. And so he says in verse 10, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. And so here's where this just general thrust is going to go throughout this chapter and really throughout this letter here. He's going to be giving them the truths that they need to be gathering around. He's going to exhort them to to let go of these petty divisions. They need to come together with the same mind and the same judgment. That word judgment in the NAS can also be translated as opinion or purpose. And the idea is that as they read this letter, they need to make these truths their own so that they don't have divisions among themselves, but that they share these beliefs and these opinions about these issues. Well, then Paul addresses what is probably a a key issue for why they're having these divisions. People were aligning around one teacher over another. He's going to come back to this. It's such a big issue. He's going to come back to it in chapter 3 as well. 
And you can imagine why this might be an issue. Remember, Paul starts the church, but other preachers have come to town and, and some other members maybe have gone off and heard the apostles and like what Cephas or Peter was teaching. They also just had prophets, local prophets coming up and saying, hey, thus saith the Lord. And so with all of this going on there, who do you listen to and what do you believe? And people were clinging to one teacher versus another teacher, and it was creating division in their church. And so in these opening verses, verses 12 to 16, Paul exhorts them to stop looking at each other through these lenses, through these categories, stop disparaging one another, recognize who we are together in Christ. And so here, before Paul even starts to address their questions in this letter, he wants to establish what is valid and invalid points of discussion or disagreement. What is invalid is, which preacher do you follow or who baptized you? Those issues don't matter. What matters is the cross and their relationship to it. If we don't get the cross right, all of these internal debates will never be settled. The cross is the foundation upon which their faith, our faith, is built. It is the means by which they have sacred union with Jesus Christ, and therefore it is the basis of their sacred union with one another. And so in verse 18, if we're actually born again, the message of the cross will have power in our life. It'll keep us from trying to argue by man's wisdom and by focusing on the cross. We will break free from that helpless attempt to find unity through man's wisdom or some other thing. And so in verse 20, Paul is calling them to give up looking to solutions from the wisdom of the world. He points out in verse 21 that the wisdom of the world has never led anyone to God. And we can surmise that since it's never led anyone to God in the past, it's not going to help right now. And so in verse 22, Jews may want to settle agreements with science and Greeks may want to settle them with sagacious wisdom, but we need to give up all that stuff and just start with the cross of Christ and what it has done for us and who we are together in Christ now that we are in Christ. And therefore, in verse 23, preach Christ crucified. Paul recognizes this is going to seem silly to the Gentiles and troubling to the Jews, but in verse 24, for anyone who has been called from among the Jews and Greeks, the preaching of the cross will have true healing, unifying power in the midst of these disputes. And so in verse 25, stick with the cross, focus on the cross. It's wiser than man's thoughts, it's more powerful than man's strength. Then in verse 26, Paul calls them to view themselves in light of this fundamental truth of the cross. Why did God call them to himself? Was it because of their wisdom or their strength or their social standing? Not at all. If anything, verse 27, God chose them because they were so foolish and weak. Their transformation and their unity is a testimony to the power of God. And so in verse 28, Paul reminds them that this is how God works. He chooses the base and the despise of the world to show just how clearly unlike the world, are his ways. And therefore, stop playing by the world's handbook. Don't argue based on who's your favorite teacher. Don't argue about who has the most miracles notched under their belt. Don't argue about who can speak the most eloquently or who seems to display the greatest wisdom. Don't base your arguments on who has the highest social standing. All of this is sinful boasting and posturing, and all of it's got to stop. And that brings us to verse 30. Verse 30 says, But by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, guys, you weren't even smart enough or wise enough or strong enough or rich enough or good enough to even choose God. He chose you. He placed you into Christ, except this fact that none of us have anything to boast about. If we're in Christ, then he, not Paul, not Apollos, not some rich dude or miracle working person, he is our wisdom. He, Jesus, is our righteousness. Jesus is our sanctification. Jesus is our redemption and no one else and so in verse 31, just as written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Everything we have, who we are in Christ, is all of God, all of Christ. No one has any wisdom or anything else from this world, from their past they can trust in, but the cross of Christ alone. And so that's chapter one of 1 Corinthians. <laughs> Already we can begin to feel the heat in our own world. So often we want to argue and debate with other Christians based upon this teacher or that denomination or that principle. And here we're seeing that the true issue is our relationship to the cross. There are going to be clear differences between teachers and doctrines, and not everyone's going to be okay. But the point of evaluation has to be the cross. It's all about the cross. It's all about Christ. And when we get that basis right, and when that becomes our fundamental basis for what we're trying to accomplish, we can then start to agree upon other things after that. And so as we work through this book, we're going to see Paul unpack this principle and his answers to their questions. And so for our own life today, as we wrap on up, as we go throughout our own day from here on out, let's pay attention to our own words and our own thoughts and our own opinions. When we say something or if we're just thinking something in our mind, let's evaluate, where did that come from? 
Was it rooted in the mindset of this world? Was it just from our own opinions? Or have we thought through these issues with biblical lenses based on who we are in Christ and what he has taught and said in his word about that issue? Or are we still trusting in our own wisdom and the wisdom of this world and and the wisdom of maybe our social standing or something else? Let us be thoroughly cross-centric people in everything we think and say. Well, on that note, thanks for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Until tomorrow, God bless.